Hello and welcome to a video which I don't normally do and the setting is fantastic for this type of video. Um, me and John thought it would be a good idea to do a bit of a, a debrief video on the two sections we did on the Romans and Reavers route. I find, and I'm sure John will agree, that we do all these kind of trips and experiences and camping and things like that and we capture all this data but we don't necessarily capture it in a format which we can look back on later on to go actually you know what that was a good idea that was a bad idea and it's there for reference later on and also to share it in such a way that everyone else can can listen into our thought processes the reasons why we did things um, and all the kind of events that happened on this particular two-day trip so the venue itself is a is, is, is a church and we were very gratefully given the opportunity to, to do this in here because it's nice and quiet and it's acoustically it's really good isn't it? It's, yeah it's lovely. It's a fantastic venue and I'm really chuffed to get the opportunity to be in here. So Roman and Reba's route first of all is a 52 mile kind of trek or trail running through the Dumfries and Galloway region into the Scottish borders in the lower, le lower lands of Scotland. Um, I believe it started in 2005 Something like that. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. And it was basically drawn together by, I want to say equestrian type people, horse yeah, riders. Horse riding groups and I think some other groups got involved along the way to sort of finalise the route as they saw it. Yeah. Um, cycling groups perhaps. Cycling groups. The National Cycling Trail or part of it is certainly. Yeah. And it was also part of the tourism industry of Scotland to, to kind of promote this part of the world as well. So it's a relatively new route. Um, so yeah, thought processes. I've, I've made some notes that I thought I'd share for you guys. So first of all, information about the route itself. What were your thoughts on, on the information about the route? It's very sparse. Um, I think on YouTube there was somebody doing a cycle day out from the Forest of A to B Top, which is the first two sections. Yeah. Sorry, the first section, first section apologies. Yeah. And then there was a gentleman did what would be would have been our third and fourth and final section from Estelle Muir to Huyck. But that's about it. There's not a lot else in terms of YouTube or documentation at all. So it was a bit of a shot in the dark, really. Yeah, you know, there were a few videos of cyclists doing the route, but you don't really get any real information for walkers apart from maybe looking at the trails that you kind of walk along. On the internet, there was loads of, I'd say, bump about the route and its origins, and they were really trying to sell it that it was it ran through Reavers territory and it was Roman roads. It sounded really, even the name of the route, Romans and Reavers, it sounds like a historical route, which up until the bit where we finished wasn't. If I'm being honest with you, it was very much forestry commission land, wind farms, um, country lanes, country lanes. You know, yeah. nothing of any real excitement to kind of view. Uh, you could get the OS maps and find settlements and, and things, but because the way the terrain is and the and the forestry is, a lot of the features that we could go and visit, like the cairns and the stones and the the ancient stuff, was kind of covered by that, or you just couldn't get to it. You couldn't see it from the tracks we were walking on. Plus, you've got the deadlines of getting from A to B. You know, you know. Daylight hours, daylight saving has stopped, so yeah. I'm starting with whichever way it works. Um, so, the, you know, it gets dark earlier, so you need to be ideally where you want to be so you can see where you're pitching off. So yeah, it's a bit and of a time pressure. And that's definitely something we'll, we'll touch on later on is um, pitching up. So, <laughs> there is no official trail map for this. We were lucky we got the aqua maps, wasn't it? Aqua maps, yeah, we put one together. Put one together for the route on two maps. You could get two 1 to 50s and five 1 to 25s, which I did as well. So you can do it and you can mark the route out as well, kind of marked on, on the map. Um, but we thought we'd get a 1 to 25 bespoke map made for this route um, so we could follow it with more detail, which obviously is beneficial. But um, no, information wise, there's not a lot. I don't think a lot of people have walked the whole route. We're gonna come back and do the next two sections uh, next year when the weather's better. It's October now, it's Halloween funnily enough. And um, Halloween 2024, you wanna be more precise. But no, information on the route, very sparse. And 
you'd like to know things like are there kind of B and B's or shops or anything else? It's, it's very limited, so I think we've done that one to death. Um, with regards to the route itself, I felt the section we did, we did the first thirty miles. I felt it was very well marked out. Mark, way marking was very good. Yeah, I, you know, you might have to look slightly past the junction or whatever, but there was definitely clear markings there. You know, you just had to be not rushing off one direction thinking it was that way, just just double check. I, I think there's only once we actually took a bearing off of, because uh, it, it, it wasn't too obvious, but yeah, it was just a tree had grown in front of the actual way marker. Yeah, there was, there was a, a little section near where the big hill was, Garagil, Garagil, where one of the park markers was hidden by some new spruce that was growing, yeah. but yeah, it, just a little bit of looking around, it was yeah. fine, but overall, I'd say 99.9% of the route so far to this point, the first 30 miles um, was well marked out. Um, we'll talk about day one route, the feelings of walking that route and the camping spot first of all. So what were your thoughts on the on the route first of all and then the camping spot? Well, it started off well on the flat and then it was steadily upwards, upwards, upwards and a bit more upwards. And then we hit the wind farms, a more to the point the wind farms hit us. And it was like it was, you're walking through forestry plantation on forestry tracks, absolutely dearth of wildlife. You couldn't see anything unless it was a bit cleared. But the noise of the wind farms, it was like walking along a motorway or a, a, you know a major road. Constant swoosh of a car going past was that sort of sound all the time. Yeah, ten miles worth of that. Yeah, you know, so it's a bit. Draining on the soul, shall I say? You know, um, you'd have to bring a pair of ear defenders. <laughs> yeah, <I think. laughs> yeah. That's all I could say on that bit. Yeah. Uh, but the camp spot we got to at the end, uh, we managed to find some water. We were using filters, so um, we just dropped up where we wanted to be. Um, it wasn't quite what we expected, but there was a nice camping spot with, with shelter in a bit of coniferous forest at the edge of the road. So we dropped on there, really. Yeah. Um, so, so there's no there's no real information on the on the the route or what you might find. So it's just a case of be prepared to pitch up anywhere you can, really. I yeah. Think, on, on, certainly on that first section. It's like I was saying in the video that I made live when I was doing the walk. If you have mobility issues, if you're a cyclist, someone in a wheelchair, whatever the case may be, you've got some good, decent tracks to go along. Um, when you're carrying a pack, walking along a trail for that distance, it's quite wearing on the feet. You get, I, I found my feet were getting really hot and it's, it's never nice walking on hard, kind of firm level ground like that. It's different when you're on a trail like the West Island Way. Yeah. You've got a bit of sponginess there. It's, it's not man-made, it's, it's pretty much natural so your feet kind of are able to cool down a little bit and not get such a pounding that you would do on that track um it did feel for me like a long drag uphill certainly from that first little bit it was and then it was kind of like a roller coaster but lots yeah. of ups and ups yeah. i can't remember exactly but the elevations it's like 1800 feet or something like that overall the whole route and we certainly did the some of the highest sections in the first two days yeah. So that was it. The wind farm, if I'm being honest with you, I did not enjoy, it, enjoy that section at all. Just echoing what John said, the, the, the actual forestry land, it felt dead. There was no life there at all. It, there was not much sign of anything going on. Um, you could argue that, yeah, well, we've got two human beings walking through the woods, things are gonna keep out of the way. Yeah, I'll give you that. But it just felt dead. Um, the wind turbines really started to bother me quite a lot. I didn't like the wind turbines. The noise was really... It's, like said, it started to take my soul a little bit. It just it just yeah, proper it grated on me. And I didn't really want to... I felt like just jacking the route there and then because I just, just didn't like it. And that's not always like me to be like that. No. But I didn't enjoy the first 10 miles of that walk through the Forest of Eye. Um, it really wasn't good. But also, what I forgot to mention was the start point. The start point is just outside of the car park, and there's just a, like, I think there was like some kind of signpost there back in the day. Yeah, it looks like there was a, a, like a, a stone block, as if there'd been some sort of plaque on yeah. there, but that had been, whatever was there had been removed, and there was just a, a, 
it was almost like a grave, half a gravestone at the side of the road saying 15 miles to beat up, you yeah. know, best of luck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, wasn't, thinking, you know? it wasn't that exciting. Um, the first day for me was a bit of a, an anti-climax because looking on the map, again, never trust a map 100% in, in regards to what I'm going to say now is that you look on the map and you see all this fantastic woodland and you think, great, I'm going to be walking through lots and lots of woodland. Actually, some of the woodland wasn't there anymore, it had been felled and replanted. So there was, there was massive sections of just destruction where the forest had come in and took the crop and, and replanted. But the, the beginning part was a bit of a, oh, you know, is that it? I thought there'd be more information. Um, the camping spot, I actually, I felt it was a really nice spot. It was. Yeah. We, we were aiming to go to a viewpoint, a 13 mile um, point on the map, and there was like a car park with a trail marker and a, a picnic area. It's, to be fair, I'd, I'd, in my head I'd visualised something a lot more grander, but actually it was just like a, a little kind of concrete, uh, kind of tarmac car standing. You could fit about four or five cars, maybe more. Um, the ground was quite churned up and, and not very nice. But luckily, on the other side of the road, there was a nice bit of forestry land there, spruce trees, and a good spot for two tents on a bit of a view um, where the sun would rise and you get a good view of the sun rising. So that was that was really nice. Yeah, it was a lovely spot. And yeah. it sheltered us from the rain that came in just yeah, after we set up. Yeah, it did. I chuck down that night. Yeah. Um, also, on, on this route, it wasn't just me and John. There was, there was Bear, my dog, who's a you know, 35, 40 kilogram Labrador that's got bags of energy, a lot yeah. more than I did. And he was just an absolute star um, on that route. But there were sections along there where I had to have him on the lead, and he hates being on the lead. And it just makes it a bit more difficult and a bit more stressful sometimes when, you're, um, when you've got a dog that doesn't like being on the lead with a pack carrying it on uh, a trail. But I managed it, and we got on there. But I'll talk about bear and, and dog walking in that regards late, in more detail later on. Water-wise, I don't feel there's much option for water, was there, if I can remember? No, I think we started off with a good supply of water on board anyway. Yeah. Um, but as we were nearing the end of the day to where we wanted to camp, we were getting higher up and it was only by luck there happened to be a farmer's gate that was open to get across the field to gather some water up from a nice running strip of small burn, you know, it's quite, well, it's about three, three, three foot wide, six, four foot wide. Um, but because we were fairly high up, there wasn't much else due to the little runs you could just pick up along the way. And what there was, was either way below you in a valley that would be hard to get to in the forestry yeah. sections, where you, you think, well, you know, it's, that's not very appetising because it's obviously been standing there for a good while and there's all sorts of stuff in it. But no, that first section was a little sparse on water. Yeah, so, so. something to consider. Um, you know, we had enough water on us, but you know, at the end of the day, you want to top up and make sure you've got a good glug ready for the morning, uh, the cooker evening meals and all that kind of malarkey. Um, the filters we were using, if you're interested, was the Grail. Um, you know, I've used them quite a lot. We both have used them quite a lot. And for a trip like this, I swear by them. I can't say any more than that. Um, that's pretty much day one kind of covered, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't really. So day two route feelings and camp spot. What's your thoughts on that? The walk down to Beta was quite nice. The walk through Beta was quite nice. It was a nice bridge. At Thomas Telford, thank you very much. Um, we might obviously you've got the North South motorway there, and, and actually that wasn't too bad because. There's a nice route that goes under it, and you're alongside the river, so that drowns out a lot of the ongoing motorway sound. And then once we got through that, it was a long, long section on narrow lanes. Yes, you've got some nice views out, actually, to the sides. But I think getting back to what Chris was saying about having bear with us, you couldn't really let him get off, so it's hard work keeping him entertained and, and getting on with where you were. Um, so there was a good stint of that before we got off to... At least off the route, I'd say. Yeah. It was, it was that. And then you're going through heavy sheep country, so again, you're off the roads, but you're still having to manage... Yeah. If, if you think of taking the dog, you're going to have to take that into consideration at some point. 
you know, I might be stealing Chris's thunder. No, 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 definitely. You can help. Just sort of saying because you know you don't, you know, you, you can't let them off the lead because obviously the farmers are not happy with dogs and their sheep, uh, and they were quite clear about that in the notices and what have you. So it's just bearing that in mind. No pun intended. Yeah, bearing that in mind. <laughs> yeah. um, so the first part is pleasant, but it's country lanes. Hard work on your feet again. Um, limited water for quite a distance until you get fairly high up and then you're onto quite heavily used forestry tracks yeah and again you're back to the not, not a lot of options to see what's going around it was you know, um, and then the weather started to close in we got to the Garrigal spot which wasn't far <laughs> horizontally from um, where we were hoping to camp up but the weather was closing in, Chris has probably had that in his video at some point, and then you got this, the contours are sort of like, well, spot where there's a gap, and it's literally, boom, you know, nose to the floor, <laughs> leading to the slope, slogging up with the wind dragging in, over the tops, once we got there, it was like, take 10 steps, have a breather, yeah. um, all the way up, and uh, got over the tops, and it was just howling, wasn't it? it's just, yeah. Fortunately, we topped up with water prior to that, so we had a good supply on board, which added to the weight, obviously. But once we got to the top, it just got to a point where it was going dark, and there was an opening in, in the forestry, it was about a 40 degrees, yeah, 30, 40 degrees slope. But there was a nice bit of shelter against the plantation, so there's a little bit of furcling around, so it's an old place. Furtling around to find a pitch spot that you wouldn't be rolling down the hill off. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, because there was nothing else, and even, well, I won't go on to the third day, but you know, that was it. We had to pitch up pretty sharpish, get dried out because it was abs we were absolutely sodden, you know. The weather had come in that quick. It, by the time you'd have got waterproofs out, put them on, or at least leggings, or all waterproof tops on anyway. Um, you know, you're doing salt through anyway, so it was not yeah. used to it. Yeah, just to echo and put my perspective on it, yeah, the first section after the camp spot on day one was the top, the first couple of miles really nice with the views, was, yeah. really pleasant, yeah. but it was on road again and it kind of went all the way down to Betok and it was like dog on a lead, which is fair enough because there were vehicles driving up and down as well, people living there, going to and from doing their business. The sheep, yes, uh, bears, bear is good around sheep and, uh, and other animals, I know he is, but other people don't know that, and it'd be irresponsible for me to just go, yeah, let's, you know, let him off lead, be, oh, he'll be fine, but you just never know, he's still a dog, so, like I said, he doesn't like being on a lead, he's never on a lead with me, normally, even at work, or when I'm out walking him, we, I go to, like, the woods, and he's just run. he's a free dog, and on the lead, he is good on the lead, but he, he's, he's very pulley sometimes when he wants to kind of, it's, someone's in front of me or um, he wants to do something. So it can be a bit challenging sometimes with him being a bit pulley. That kind of bergen on some of the terrain can be an issue. Um, you know, it, it could pull me over. Again, 35, 40 kilo dog that's, that knows how to use his weight on a lead pulling me would easily pull me over I'm not, I'm not too scared to say that it will happen it could happen especially if the ground's um, a bit dodgy so half half that route was pretty much road or trails with sheep on it which again I wasn't having a good time with that one because you know Bear wanted to be free I get, I get that he's a dog um, you could argue I, could probably, I should put him on a lead more and work harder with him not being as pulley on the lead but I'm quite happy for him being a free dog and that's, that's just my choice there um, the second part, we kind of got into the forestry up that big hill initially. Um, wasn't too bad, and it kind of you kind of went up the forestry track, and it was kind of all the way down, wasn't it? After yeah, that, yeah. with a few little ups in between, um, wasn't too bad. Just again, there was massive sections been chopped down, so it wasn't pretty necessarily to look at. Um, and when we topped up, we topped up at the right time. Sometimes, and I've said this before, I said in my video, yeah. when you think something, act on it. And I was given that advice once, and I've, it resonated with me deeply that if you think you need to do something, don't wait to do it. Do it there and then. Yeah. <laughs> we needed to drink, and because we were starting, you know, you get that drop in energy, you get thirsty, you feel yourself, you, you can feel it. 
So we stopped that good glug and topped up and then we were good. And we needed that glug because we weren't expecting the sheer steepness of the, of, of the gradient we were about to go up. Yeah. Um, that particular track where the gradient was, we spoke about this, probably would have been a good time to call it a day, yeah, as in set, hindsight, yeah. in hindsight yeah. we call it. The clag was coming in, we could see it in the valleys. Um, it was a bit misty, a bit, bit drizzly. And you could tell it was going to get worse. And in hindsight, we should have gone, you know what, let's, let's pitch here. Because we wouldn't have got as wet. But we decided to carry on. So we, we needed to make our distance, right? Um, the track itself wasn't, it hasn't been well maintained. That particular section was a section where the way marker wasn't that good. It was hidden behind a tree. And the track itself was full of spruce sticking out. It was on the knife edge pretty much. It was a sheer drop well, to yeah, the right side. Oh yeah, you got a very strong slope off to your right. And uh, you've literally got one person's width. Yeah, and not the best of footing going up. Um, the couple of times I said to, just to that, there were times thinking I, should, I would would have been happily using my lap lander <laughs> just to clear the path because it wasn't safe to go around the edge. You had to throw stuff down that was yeah. half down, blocking the path. And know? that's something I'd never on a, on a kind of hiking trip. I would never think oh, I'll bring a saw, even a lap lander. No. You, you know, you think most trails are kind of kept with this trail. I don't think many people have done this trail, if I'm being honest with you. Certainly from what I've seen on YouTube, but I know I can't use YouTube as kind of a data, kind of statistical data that how many people have done the trip. But by looking at the, the sections which weren't very well maintained, it kind of, I don't know, I don't think many people have done it, looking at on the sections which weren't forestry track. But um, something to think about, Kit wise is maybe yeah a little saw to trim off them bits that will cause yeah, me yeah, just in case you come across we have both got not a small everyday carry knives just for working on food or whatever or bits yeah. of things but yeah I'd take I'd take a small saw out with me next time if I thought it was going to be yeah. an obstructive path in some it's not like the West Island Way where it's clearly carved down bum 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 you know short of tripping up over your own feet you know yeah. Um, Again, Bear was off lead in, at this section because there was no opportunity for him to get anything. There was no sheep around, it's forestry. Mm -hmm. But the, the concern was, was the knife edge to the right-hand side of me. He was really interested in jumping up and going and looking over because it's all bracken to the right-hand side. So imagine like a track with heavy spruce to the left, up a steep angle, with a sheer drop to the right-hand side, full of bracken and, and bushes. Well, he wanted to jump up and look down because there was a stream running quite deeply down the bottom and he kept jumping up to look. And I was getting concerned that he's going to jump up and, and, and lose his footing and go. So I had to put him on the lead. So it was a it might never matter kind of putting him on the lead <laughs> whilst using one walking pole to get up the slope, which would normally I'd use two. But again, things are there to test me, and we got there. That was the main yeah. thing. When we got up to the top section, it was like open moorland, and it was imagine standing in a shower on full blast on cold with multiple fans blowing against you that's that's what it, i could yeah, describe it as failing light the wind was coming in it was horizontal rain again typical scotland and something that i don't think any of us the west Highland Way was bad yeah, and it, yeah. it was on par with, with maybe one day like that you know it's, it's nothing we're not unfamiliar with um but again i felt if i'm being honest we talked about the waterproof trousers. Yeah. I felt maybe we, we kind of, we were so tired after getting up that hill, we didn't think to go, you know, we need to stop and put our walking our waterproof trousers on. If I'm being honest, yeah, we should put them on earlier. It still would have changed the outcome, yeah. but it would have made things a little bit dry on the legs, on our legs, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, we probably both thought, I know I thought oh, I should put my trousers on, but I didn't act on it. Likewise, yeah, I put my hand up to that as well. You know, yeah. and, Again, it's, it's them telltale signs you need to think about, you know, if you think you act on it, it won't, it won't drag out too much more. Then when we got up the top, we realised we were, we were three or four miles from where we needed to get to to our, our 26 mile point. And the weather just came in even more and more and more. The light was rapidly dropping. I personally was starting to get cold and I, mm. going back to what I said earlier, in my mind we should have stopped earlier and, and set up but we were we need to get to that that point we're very focused on what we needed to do and that's that's just what we were doing we both we've always been the same we'll, we'll discuss things we'll agree things we'll do it 
but it got to the point where I started to feel really cold. I was absolutely saturated. Um, the wind was coming in. It was almost, it was pretty much pitch black, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. His head torches obviously yeah. see what he was doing. And we just, uh, we need to get off the track now. Um, mm. So we, we we went down this this kind of incline. <laughs> same kind. Imagine again forestry commission land that's been felled and they've replanted it. So it's lumpy, bumpy, lots of babies' heads and moss, and it was just all over the place, but on a steep angle. Well, we eventually found a nice section near some spruce, which must have been about five or six years old. You know, they're like Christmas trees, six foot, seven foot height, maybe eight foot in places, trees. We thought we'd tuck in close to them so we were out of the wind because the wind was, you know, the wind chill. We didn't want that. We were already wet. We knew we were going to have a wettish night um, until we got into our showers. So mm -hmm. it was getting the showers and get dry. Um, the problem is with what happened to me in particular was I actually found that I thought it was the right spot considering the circumstances. You've got a good spot, yeah. <laughs> just, just, just luck, just luck more than anything, it was just luck, no, no, it pure was, luck, yeah. that's all yeah. it was. Um, I set my tent up quite quickly. Again, I've got a new Hilliberg. I've used it camping like um, a few times before this trip, but this is the first time I've used it on a proper trip. First time I set it up at night and I didn't pack it away correctly the following night. So because of my crap admin, I had a bit of tingle tangle with some of the cords, but it was quickly sorted out. Set up, done. Then I had the, the problem, well, I've got a, a Labrador that I need to dry and it's absolutely hammering down with rain. The minute I kind of got the towel out and tried to, to douse him down, he just rocketed straight into the tent. He didn't want to be outside either. So I've got a soaking wet Labrador in my tent now and the, the you know, like the kind of life venture towels, they, they can only absorb so much moisture. So it's a case of just kind of chuck his dog bed down, let that be a sponge, try and dry him down as much as I can before I got in and got myself sorted. So I was on a loser straight away. Uh, I've learned a lot of lessons from that. And even, even if I had the best towel in the world, drying a dog, they never get dry. There's always that dampness about them, especially Labradors. Um, I've never been able to dry a dog perfectly straight away. They're always that kind of, there's always a bit on them, isn't there, let's face it. So my tent was pretty wet straight away. But overall, the camping spot, it served its purpose. It allowed me to, I did have a good night's sleep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I did have a good sleep. I got warm, I got dry, I got fed. Uh, I say dry in loose in the loosest terms, <laughs> um, and I got a, overall a good night's sleep. The dog got to sleep. We had to cozy up at certain points because we were kind of he was wet and I was damp, um, but we got there in the end. But overall, it's, it's, it served its purpose. And, you know, you've done the job. Anything you add on day two? No, I, I, I managed to get a bit of the camp spot, but I was using a tent I've used before that I've set up in the night before. But because you're on an odd slope, it changes the configuration. It was a hex peak 4A. Lovely little tent, mm -hmm. not, not an issue with the tent. It was just having to adjust to having found a little bit of a platform and the rest was on a slope. So basically to get in the tent, I, eventually once it was set up, I had to sort of go in backwards <laughs> on the slope to get to the level bit. And then well, if I didn't go out again till the morning, that was it. But yeah. it was crawl out because there was no room to actually, I couldn't get the door fully closed anyway, which didn't matter. But I, I, I did have with me one of the orange mats, you know, a square top uh, ground sheeting mat with aluminium on the back, which I doubled over, mm -hmm. gave me a nice heat thermal base to, to sit on before I got the shelter set up. That's another story, but I won't, I won't labour that one. But I got a decent night's sleep anyway. So, Walking with a dog, ups and downs. Now, I absolutely love taking Bear with me on camping trips, walks, because watching him run around and be full of beans and happy with life, just, it makes me happy, you know? Uh, back in May, I attempted to walk the East Highland Way and did the first day and pulled the pin because I hadn't prepared fully for hiking that distance, or, the whole, the whole trip was going to be the East Highland Way and the Space Side Way with me and the dog. It didn't work out because I hadn't, it was a last minute dot com decision to bring a dog literally the day before I went up and went, I'll bring the dog. Didn't fully think it through about food, distance, weight, ticks, 
um, how am I going to go shopping, all the kind of things I'd need to think about for taking a dog on a long trip. And when I mean shopping, I mean like, well, where am I going to put him if I need to go into a shop? Because, uh, you know, I don't want to leave him outside, etc., etc. There was loads of things I hadn't thought about at all. And over, so from May till now, which is October, I had time to reflect and think about what I'm going to be doing, lessons learned, and I thought, well, this is only going to be a, a four day trip. Again, it's quite hard. I, I, I tried him on dry food on the trip before, he, he wasn't interested. But I know he, like, he likes lilies, so I thought, well, I'll get him two tins of lilies per day, that should be good. I was carrying a bit of extra weight, which it wasn't an issue, you know, it really wasn't an issue at all, at all. Um, had the tick kit with me this time all squared away, I could check him over, it wasn't a problem. It was the more the fact that you've got to be constantly watching what he's doing when he's off lead, because the terrain, the location is unfamiliar to me. I don't know if there's sheep or any random surprises out which might distract him or take his attention, or other people, other dog owners. So that knife edge, for example, along it's there. Knife edge, and in terms of sheep, while we're, there was one occasion, and it was in the climb and what have you, no warning notices that there were sheep roaming, no. which you often do see, um, and it's it, it's it's good that. Bear is really good on recall. Yeah. He saw three sheep that were in the distance in the clag. You can only just see them because of obviously grey, whatever, and the mucky in the weather. And as soon as he was cold, he was back. But, you know, it's just being aware that there's surprises like that around the corner. So if the dog's off, you need to have good recall on it. Yeah. And hopefully there's no farmers around who are going to understandably get a bit ratty about it. Yeah. You know? it's, it's, it's like looking after a child. A young, a young child, um, you know, making sure he's got enough water, enough food, and you know, it's sometimes it's hard enough just getting through what you're doing without mm. to worry about the dog as well. Uh, and he's a big dog, and most people I see camping, and I've seen on YouTube, they've, they've had smaller dogs, and you know, it's something that I really have to think about if I take him again on another trip because I'm there to enjoy it myself. Um, so that was the dog. Ups and downs, so brilliant having the dog there, doing the walk, watching him. He was actually, he's smashing it. He was, <laughs> he must have done, we, so say we did 30 miles, he must have done over 100 easily, walk, running to and from, to and from, investigate. He was living his best life, he really was. And he was kind of up in the morning, right, come on in, let's go. It was yeah. brilliant. It was such a good experience to spend that time with him, you know, and get some quality pictures and video footage of him and everything else. The cons, but I say it's looking after a child, it's hard work, in my opinion, other people might disagree, but for me, constantly making sure he's okay, he's not going to jump off anything and be silly or have a fight of a bloody um, sheep or a farmer or, or anything else, I just felt like it would have been easier. The tent, again we've been in tents before with the dog, but he literally he rushed that tent, he was <laughs> in there. Bear didn't think, I'm going to get the inside of this tent completely wet and get everything else wet at the same time he just wanted out of the weather so that's something that you know if I hadn't have had the dog necessarily I wouldn't have got as wet inside the tent and we we could have maybe carried on with what we were doing but that's another story so yeah brilliant if you've got a dog take it experience it but bear in mind you know the kind of things that I've mentioned so far um, Kit we used, pros and cons. Kit, so think about the kit you used, what was good for you, what was not so good for you, if any? I think on reflection, uh, Little Hex Peak was fine. As I say, it was only the terrain that caused the pro you know, challenges with setting up as you'd want it. Um, but that's, that's a little bit of a challenge for you when you get there and just work around it as best you can. Uh, so it's not, the Little Hex Peak was fine. Next time, I, if I knew I was going through similar uncharted territory, should we say, I might take a slightly different uh, tent that's perhaps you know one pole or two pole, sort of self-standing, obviously with pegs down if need, as, as needed. Um, rucksack, it's the first time I've used it. It was an Osprey, so it's not it's not a cheap bag. It's a good bag. Um, I found it quite comfortable for what I was carrying, but I wasn't carrying obviously dog food and stuff that Chris had to. Uh, lost by 68 litre, yeah, very good. It was comfy on, on my back, comfy on my shoulders. Um, I took 
a down bag in a, in a dry sack in a bivy bag, certainly on the second night. I didn't use it on the first night because we were all set up in the dry, it was fine. Um, but I think with hindsight, if I was looking at this time of year, I would take a synthetic bag. Yes, it's a bit of extra weight, but comfort, keep you warm, make sure you're looked after by yourself, I think it's important. Uh, food, um, expedition foods, top notch. Um, pasta carbonara, first night, chili con carne, the second, absolutely toasty. You know, um, topped up with a lot of stockings and old cakes and trek bars, <laughs> also get, some, get some energy back in your system. Um, and the electrolytes, mm. I think water's, water's fine, but when you Travelling over distances like that, you need something a little more of a supplement. Um, there's loads of stuff out there, Fizz, SIS, uh, all do the same sort of job. If you're in, in, into your cycling or the sports, you know, you've got your gel sachets and all that. Um, but I think you do need that extra just to replace the natural minerals and that, that you are sweating out heavy, heavy, heavy duty time. Um, Paramo jacket. Yeah, fine. Keeps the water out. Yes, you might feel as though you're cold and wet, but as soon as you stop, you can feel yourself warming up inside it. And my favourite new addition of kit was a Bringy string vest. Um, have a look at they they were wonderful. I basically had a montane thin dark t um, base layer over that, and as soon as the rain came in, I just swept that off, put my waterproof jacket on, and it was lovely. You know, didn't get too hot by leaving the base layer on, but there's like that cushion of air against you. You know, it does what it says on the packet, basically. So, um, thanks to Paul Mesner for that one because he has it. It's always video, and yeah, not right, fair enough, mate. You know, yeah, um, take your advice and your guidance or recommendation for want to do a better word. Uh, boots, dry sport boots, Crusaders. Did a, got them out of the box. Walked the West Island way last year. Absolutely. Superb boots, you know. Everyone's got their own choices, them, but that's my, they're my favourite walking boots. Yeah. Um, certainly for the bad weather. Um, that's about it, I think, really. Oh, a pair of gaiters. Yeah, just keep the water, you know, below your knees. If it's not, you know, it's been raining or heavy dew, just means you're not just getting sodden around the bottoms of your legs. Yeah. Um, I think that's about it, really. Cool. So I had the Osprey 68 as well, um, using the same packs. Um, first time I probably used it on a trip and I'm not 100% convinced on it yet. There are some good features like I like the, the ceiling toggle on the top of the pouch, yeah. on the main pouch, it kind of, it's just easy on it, pull in and pull out and it's done. I like the stretchy pouches on the front and on the side and it's a really comfy pack. I had no issues with the comfort of the pack at all or anything else like that. What my problem was, I just felt it's a bit too small for what I needed. And that must, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of comment on that now. So I'm used to a military style PLC type setup with two side pouches, a main pouch with a cold pouch on the lid. I've been using the Sabre 75 uh, with side pouches for many years now. And I'm very familiar with that setup. I did the West Highland Way of that setup. That setup works for me. There was no faff with the Bergen. Again, it's, I find that pack really comfortable, but the reason why I chose the Osprey this time because it was like two kilos lighter. Um, it's four, was it four and a half kilos for the same? With the side pouches. With the side pouches, yeah. whereas the Osprey is like two, two and a half. So it was a no brainer. So I give it a good, a good couple of days run, and yeah, no complaints. The only thing that bothered me was I missed the side pouches because I had my kind of setup on my saber with a tent and my kind of cooking and water purification kit on one side, and the main pouch was kind of left alone. Um, so I need to maybe use it a few more times just to see, but I think I'm going to migrate for a longer walk back to the Saber 75. Um, the Hilleberg, absolutely fantastic tent. Really, it's the Una. Really, again, Paul Mesner. I've been looking at Hilleberg's for a while, but then I saw his video 
on that and I thought yeah you know what I'll give that a go and it's fantastic me all my kit the dog and there was still plenty of space and the vestibule had loads of stuff in it as well like boots and wet kit it was a really good pack um, what I will do for the next trip is I'm going to get myself a tarp to go over it to give myself a porched area that will get that will increase my kind of wet dry routine so the unit for me is a, a big yes with, certainly with a tarp over it I think that'll give me the extra area to administrate myself and allow me to kind of do a wet drills, dry drills type of setup routine, especially if I bring a dog again. Have been looking at tarps. <laughs> Any burgers you can imagine that isn't cheap for the tarp five, but I might consider getting one of them. If not, I've got an XB10. It's just weight and practicality. Um, if I can find an alternative, or if you if you know one that works for that, then stick it in the in the comments of this video if you if you want. But that's kind of what I'm going to do with that one. Boots. I too was wearing Grice Sport boots. I have got a pair of, um, of the Crusader, the same as John, and they fit me really well. I've also got a pair of the Everest ones, which I wore on this trip. They are comfortable boots. However, I felt like they weren't wide enough in the feet for me, and I felt my little toes kind of pinching in a little bit. So. I'm glad I found that now before I did a longer trip. I have been out on hikes on them, but not 13 mile day walks with heavy packs. So that's something to think about, is uh, maybe give my um, Crusader a bit of a burn for its money. Maybe on the next time I do the next two sections, get that finished off. I didn't take a jet ball this time, I just took a little MSR rocket pocket type stove um, into a titanium cup and that worked really well. That, that, yeah, that worked well, can't say any more than that. Allowed me to have more space in my pack, whereas jet balls, great as they are, as quick as they are, they're quite bulky, so we both kind of decided to yeah, move yeah. away. I took a little freestanding OEX uh, vul volcano or Vulcan style, I can't remember, sadly mm -hmm. the, the exact name, but you know, the, the attachment off to a camp. And I took this uh, Boundless Voyage 750mm um, pot, can get most of that stored in there and generally speaking that pot full of water boiled up did my expedition food pack and a, you know the old ammo flask for one of the great life venture thermal flask for a coffee or hot chocolate whatever which basically the evening that's all i wanted you yeah. know so it's a job done um food wise expedition food all the way i've i used them on the west Salem way i've used them in other things as well I really rate them. I, I went for the 1,000 um, calorie ones this time because, again, I was using 800s on the West Highland Way and was doing kind of two meals a night. Um, so I went for the 1,000. The 1,000 is, is good, but again, I might have like a, I might have another one to supplement that because you do burn, certainly I burn a lot of calories, but I can't knock them for taste. Really, like, the chili con carne one was absolutely oh, banging. Fun. First time I had it, yeah, it's yeah. Brilliant, yeah. I really enjoyed it. So I personally recommend expedition meals or food as a as a good pack to carry. And they do all kind of eco friendly ones and all, all sorts of um, variations for dietary requirements if you want to put it politically correctly. But um, yeah, so they've got lots of options available, which I would highly recommend giving a go. I've I've tried a few of the the vegetarian and vegan friendly ones. And yeah, even though they're, they're pretty good. Uh, what else? Grail, can't knock that. that. That is what it is. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, we've got the little Hydro Pack. Hydro Pack, three litres. Um, which, you know, if, if you want to use them for something after, it's just sterilising fluid like Milton or something, just to make sure there's no cross contamination from the, the dirty water you've been picking up. But we used it on the West Island Way. Great combination. Yeah. yeah, instead of taking the grail down to the river source and maybe getting it lost or damaged or contaminated, we brought the, the three litre hydro pack bag, used that to collect the water, and then in our own, our own time, we kind of filled the grail up and processed it and filled up our water bottles and everything. It was no faff, that's, that's the main thing. And you had like a dirty water, clean water kind of uh, water container, so there was clear distinction to what was dirty and what was clean, so there was no cross contamination, and everything was good in that regards. I still had some um, um, period tabs and things with me just in case, and a, yeah. a, a parasilk nylon um, 
Milman. Milman bag. Yeah. So that a couple of bases with water just in case. What else? I had, I brought with me my old army snug pack softy nine bag, which I used like a duvet. Um, that worked really well. Even when I was saturated wet with the dog um, inside the tent, there was still thermal value. So it's a synthetic bag. I do like, and I do rate down bags, yeah. but for this trip, because I kind of had a feeling maybe one night we might get wet, I'm bringing the dog, I'll bring it just in case, and it worked out well. What I didn't do this time, I didn't bring, on the West Island way, I brought my Therma Rest, as well as a, a foam mat, like a Z Light type pack, like a concertina folding mat. I always bring a foam mat with me, irrespective of what I do, because if my air mat goes, I've got a backup. I'm, I'm big on contingency. This trip, I didn't bring the Therma Rest because I didn't fancy bear popping it. I've had that firm rest like 14, 15 years and it's been all around the world, done all sorts of stuff and it's still going strong. And I've only ever had one puncher, so I'm quite attached to it. <laughs> and, mm. But no, even, even the mat I had, and you might see it in the videos, it's just a blue kind of concertina folding foam mat, it did the job. So that combination worked well and I'm, I was thankful I didn't bring the bag I was going to bring, which was a, an old army down bag, which would have just absorbed everything I would have been pretty, mm. pretty bad. Well, I had an inflatable one of the four decathlon four class sleeping mats, which is, is a, it seems like a heavier material than say the Neo Air. Not, not, I've got a Neo Air, so I'm not knocking it. Uh, obviously, it's, it's about half a kilo that. But I, I had a doubled over thermal sort of ground sheet underneath that to protect the the, the, the mat itself. Mm -hmm. uh, usually on the first night, second night because of the constraints of the terrain. I just cuddled up all on my thermal mat, the ground sheet. Um, unfortunately, we were like bumpy heather, baby heads, lots of stuff. Yeah. It was just a case of the grounds absorbing my my weight. And uh, yeah, that's good. Certainly, with regards to clothing, um, wool was key, 100%. I was wearing wool um, base layers, wool hats. Um, yeah, I, I can't not mention how good wool is when you're soaking wet and the wind's coming in. What I'm going to do is get some better gloves. I won't mention the brand of the gloves because it'll be unfair, but I've got a set of gloves that I've used on both trips now and they just they just don't work for me. So I'm going to get some gloves. I'm going to get two sets. A set of wool and a set of waterproof. Or if I can get one that does both, that'll be good. Again, if you know any, mention it in the comments. Um, going back to the tent, I said about the Tart 5. Now, I think certainly considering where we were in that kind of spongy plantation, longer tent pegs would have been handy um, yeah, for me, yeah. definitely. Um, the ones I had were like six, inch, six inches, give or take, yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, a few that were slightly longer. I have a mix of a couple of different lengths of pegs, but also I carry some titanium soft ground pegs, that are the, you know, the, the V shape. Yeah. They, they helped out on the second night for sure. Try and get a, a firm base with the wind, but yeah. Yeah. So kit wise, I'm trying to think what else kit wise. That was pretty much the most memorable bits about pros and cons of kits. Uh, nothing else really I can think of. Go back to the food. I, I brought some herbal teas with me, and I had a herbal tea, and I just forgot how refreshing a herbal tea can be in the yeah. morning. Yeah. I'm kind of staying away from coffee and normal tea, if you want to call it that, when I'm on trips, because I just find that once I kind of have one of them, I pop the seal very quickly and I'm constantly going to the toilet. So I'm sticking more to just plain water. I did get some key diet, um, what do you call it, like orange powder. Yeah. Get Abby Barnes and Staying Wild. I, I, I got it from her the idea. She, she, she puts a lot of flavourings in her water to, so she keeps drinking water because she's very bad, allegedly, according to her, for drinking. And I tried it as well, and it actually went really well. And just echoing what John said, electrolytes are really good. You've got to keep on top of them because you kind of drink water so much, but you're not replenishing the salts and, and um, minerals that you need. I also supplement myself with some salt sticks salt sticks which again are really good and I've used before I suffer bad with cramps so I need to be careful um, with that one as well uh, yeah so kit wise that's probably pros and cons there wasn't many, much cons with the kit I had apart from maybe 
the backpack, but I've kind of covered that one to death. Yeah. Um, for those who know me, I took quite a few coffee bags and I didn't use one of them. I just had hot chocolate, so... Yeah. Yeah, it's just... For similar reasons to, to Chris, the, the hot chocolate was more warming at the time, much as I like my coffee. It, it, you just got to make, no, it's not the right thing to have at this point in time. Yeah. yeah. Trip takeaways. What's your takeaway from this, this trip so far, then? I th- I, I'm, in terms of mini market, I think I need to. I won't go into reason, but I've had a few months where I've not really been able to get out. So fitness was not where I would want it to be starting at, particularly that first two days where there's a lot of climbing up and downs. Um, didn't stop us doing it, but you know, yeah, I could have done with a bit more getting out on the ground before then. But that was just unavoidable. Not, not, wasn't possible. Um, thought in terms of the, the kit I had for the conditions, given what we've already said, yeah, I've got the right stuff. There are no facilities on the route, so unless you're prepared to go into Beta, we didn't. Go into Beta to see what they've got on a Sunday morning, as it happened to be. Um, but it's not like the West Highland Way, where you know there's lots of eateries or options to replenish food on the road. It's You will need to take what you need and possibly a little bit spurt to cover any contingency that you, you can't think of and, and work out beforehand if you need to sort of be taken off the route where is that going to happen because there's, again there's probably only one option for that yeah. at the end of day two um, depending on where you finish your route you know you could I'd, I'd say mind that uh, but I'm going to look at the kit again look at a synthetic bag for when I'm out in the really wet weather in the highlands or borders areas, um, much as I like my down jacket, uh, down uh, sleeping bags like Chris, um, boots and everything else is fine. Um, no, I, I think a few personal things to think about on the fitness levels and what have you. Um, no, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, definitely not invested enough time into my fitness yes we did the west island way literally a year ago and haven't done much really since then maybe a few eight milers here and there but not really carrying kick just day walking kind of lowland stuff so definitely focus more on my fitness i wasn't surprisingly i wasn't hanging out i wasn't blowing i was actually physically i was okay i wasn't out of breath much but you know you would be going up quite a steep hill anyway but even then I wasn't blown out as much as what I was on the West Island way I can honestly say no, that no, you're right, yeah. so fitness wise more conditioning I'd say along with a bit more fitness the fitter you are it goes without saying the easier it will be so definitely need to work on that and that's the idea of kind of these little micro trips that we're doing you know we potentially got a big trip or a big walk coming up next year and there'll be silly just to go yeah we did the west highland way we'll just go and smash that out as well so these little little trips we're doing little two three four days is just confirming what works what doesn't work so we can reflect back and, and tweak things to suit us to make sure we are optimum so definitely fitness kit wise i've kind of already mentioned it there's a few things i'm going to pursue just to see 100 percent if it's going to work or not in my head i've got an idea but i want to scratch that itch and just make sure that it doesn't work for me or it does work for me so a few tweaks on kit here uh, other takeaways again i need to think about if the dog's going to come with me on longer walks i'm kind of the of the opinion that no <laughs> if i'm being honest yeah but there might be opportunity for smaller smaller trips you know you definitely won't do the west island way or the east island way or the space side way in one big hit, unless I move up here and do it in sections, you know, mm-hmm. it's just too much to do, and we get on with. He's, he's a big, he's a big dog, and don't mean like massive, but he's he's, he's bigger than a, a Yorkshire Terrier or a, or a Jack Russell. So that's another thing. Bears probably not going to be on a longer walking distance trip again, um, which is sad. But again, I do this selfishly for myself as well as spending time with John and it's good to get out and it's kind of like a little reset a little kind of you go back more invigorated when you get home you usually achieve something that's 
better than sitting around doing nothing on your time off. Uh, other takeaways for me, kit, fitness, dog, that's really it, I can honestly think, yeah, it's it just again a little kind of tester before the next big trip because again I wouldn't want to invest my time, money and effort into doing something like, like, like both them walks in one hit. Mm. And then fell on the first hurdle, like I did on the East Highway. I, you know, I, I epically messed up. I just got sucked into the romance of taking the dog, and it all went wrong. And that's my bad, and I take full ownership of that. Uh, but on the plus side, I got to spend two weeks with my mum in Scotland and, and, and Dave in Scotland with my little girl and the dog. So it was, I can't complain about no, that. No. You can't get that time back. But in there, I can't be to do something and didn't do it. So I need to. Reevaluate what I did wrong and get it right for the next one. And if you're interested in more information on that, I did a video on that. Uh, I think it was Fail to Prepare, Prepare to Fail, yeah, I the title, it, something yeah. like that. So it's, again, you look through my YouTube history, you'll see that. But that's that's my takeaways. The next sections and part two. What's your thoughts on the next section and part two? <clears throat> I think they look more appealing in terms of scenery, not necessarily going to be easier. I mean, we, we had a quick look at part of it this morning and it's like nose to the grindstone from minute one, isn't it? What I would say though, if people are looking at doing the four days together, four, the four sections together, there is a section at Estelle Muir, I forget the distance point, but there is a point, a part of the, the route there where you're walking along the main road quite a bit of traffic on that road and there's no real footway other than grass verges which according to the road signs are weak verges but you know you've got a fair old stint kilometre or more yeah um, heavy pack of that next to traffic it's certainly would want to do it at night time um, or in failing light so but the next two the next part of the route through to Hoyk from Eskdale Muir Looks more interesting in the sense that there are features along the way that we, depending on time availability, we might do three days, only doing eight miles to get to the end. It's about 24 miles to hike from there. But it's to camp at specific locations that have got a particular interest for us. Yeah. You know? um, or if you've only got two days, do the first eight, eight miles so we can camp at, a, again, a location. Um, and it's the more hilly route, and then a 16 miler to get back to, to the end point. So, yeah, looking forward to that. Um, you know, might have a new tent by then, you know, no. <laughs> he's, got me, he's got me going. Um, <laughs> I'll have to check the pension, see how that's yeah. going. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I, I love the time up here. Um, you find yourself in many ways. Even though it might be hard graft and you, you know it might cut, not got to do exactly what you wanted to do for the best reasons, yeah. Um, yeah, it's good for the soul, good for the mind, whatever. So I'm just grateful to get out here and have a good time with Chris and Burr when he's with, with us. Yeah. And to meet you know the rest of Chris's family up here, his mom and yeah. Dave, and obviously we've got Molly up here with us today as well. Yeah. So it's nice. It's a nice holiday for me. So no, that's cool. So part two for me will be more interesting I believe. There's a Roman signal station which I've been to before which is quite cool, a bit historical and it's really where the Romans and Reavers trail I feel gets his name because, because of that. It's Reavers country, you've got the Roman road, the Roman signal station all the way through the crake. Um, that section is quite cool. The section from the Crate to Hoik, again, there's, there's quite a lot of history along that bit. I've been in and around that area, so I'm quite familiar with what's, with what's there. There's a trick point there, I'm not going back that. And, yeah, I feel like it's the more interesting section of the route. And, if I'm being honest with you, the first section for me, I don't think I'll ever do again. I'm not that interested. It, it didn't flick or make me excited at all. They flip the switch, made me excited, and I'll be quite happy never to do that again. That's not it. Say it didn't really, it really didn't do anything for me. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sorry if that upsets people, but that's just how I feel about it. The second section, I'm a bit more positive, a bit more upbeat about. I'm a bit more familiar with. I'm looking at the maps as well. It, it just seems like a better section. 
and you get that. With regards to options, yeah, we could do eight miles and then 16 miles, like have a shorter day and a long quiz day to get to Hoik. But no, it's about, again, we're up here, we might make the most of it. We want to make sure our kit is in good order. We've got a routine in place that everything works, everything functions as it should, ready for more of a longer trip. It's not, again, it's not always about smashing days out and, and crunching miles. It's about making sure it w w works and getting good data back from that. Um, the end point of the Roman Reavers Way just abruptly ends on the, in a field in the middle of nowhere. There's no official kind of sign or statue or anything it just ends it links onto it lifts you straight onto a, a, the Reavers one of the Reavers routes or the one of the other drove roads yeah. yeah it's nothing exciting and that's a shame you know they're trying to promote a, a walk and the start and finishing points there's no real definition um, we've got an idea where we want to finish and it's a nice little spot but you'll see that on the video whenever it comes up um, anything else part two yeah just looking forward to it really yeah. that was it so we we initially planned to do this in four days, and we did two, two or four, or three really, two and a half, two and a half, two and a half yeah. days. And we were literally because of the amount of rain over the, the two days and everything else, we just got really kind of wet and claggy, uh, especially with the dog. So I think it's important that when you go and do this kind of stuff, is to to get rid of the ego and realise you know when it when it's time to stop when to make that call it'll always be there you know there's no shame in going you know what I'm not enjoying this let's call it a day and I, I can honestly I speak for myself I speak for John I was I was quite wet um, again probably bad habit on my part but the dog rushed into the tent and got everything saturated you can imagine and there was no going back from that the next day it was, it was claggy all day no opportunity to dry I didn't have the fortunate option of having an extra day potentially you know I don't know when the sun's coming out so it was kind of a case of you know what let's make the right call we could grizz it out we could do one more night we could we could there's lots of we coulds but no definites and we both agreed that you know what let's not be heroes here we've got a lot of information we've learned lots of things with lots of data back on the whole event let's call it a day reevaluate and come back another day when it will be more beneficial for everyone and that's what we decided to do again because there, there isn't a lot it's actually in one respect it's remote but not if that makes sense mm. you know there's not there's no kind of B&Bs or anything to stay without having to walk miles out of where you are so you are pretty much on your own if that makes sense mm. so yeah it was decided that when we get to a certain point We'll call it a day there, and then just pick it up again next year. So there you are, and you know we saw in terms of people on the trail. I think there's one mountain biker, Menden and Poncture. Everybody else was local dog walkers that had just ventured out onto a part of it to go back home again. You know, taking dogs out. And even then, there wasn't many of them, was there? No, no, two or three. You know, they all had Labradors, Yeah, lots of Labradors, <laughs> black labs as well. Yeah, but, but uh, no, 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 definitely. So I mean, the thing with the dog, of course, he can't, Chris can say he's cold and wet, I can say I'm cold and wet. Dog can't answer for himself, so you've got, a, you've got a dog, you've got... Actually, they've got to come first in some respects. Yeah. In combination with your own condition, you know? Yeah. He goes a bit shivery at points, even though, from my best efforts, of trying to dry him. That's why, in the end, yeah. I kind of got him in the sleeping bag with me and just kind of, we both warmed each other up and trying to get him dry as best I could. And obviously, I, I got wet then even though nothing's ever obvious. But uh, no, takeaways, yeah. First two, first, what, 20 odd miles, probably wouldn't do again. No. I might recommend it to somebody who's upset with me, there you go. <laughs> but I can honestly say the next 20 odd miles, it, it, it is a lot better, I know it will be. I might yeah. say different when I do the video, but I know from knowing the area, it should be good, but, um, any final comments, any thoughts? No, I'm just looking forward to it. Perversely, really enjoyed the challenge mm. with the two days we did. Um, and the, or the two and a half days we did, basically, to get to a pick-up point. And uh, looking forward to the next two sections, or three sections, if it turns out that way, when we get to do it next year. Cool. So, yeah. Thanks. 
thanks for Chris's company. Always enjoy his company. And birds, to be honest. Yeah, but, you know, it's, been, nice. it's been a good walk. And uh, I hope, if you've watched all this, I don't know, that you get some valuable data points to think about or consider. If you've got any comments, feedback, please put it on the actual... In a, I like dialogue, so if you've got anything you want to discuss, any points of view, you know, Chris, you're wrong, or could you do this, Chris? Whatever you, whatever you feel, as long as it's not, you know, it's constructive, I'm always open to discussion, always open to constructive feedback and criticism. That's how we grow, you know, not too shy. I won't shy away from it. But if you haven't got any, any thought processes, stick it on the, uh, the comments if you watch it this far. I know it's probably been quite a long video, but I do appreciate your time and effort in watching not only this video, but any video that I put up. And uh, I look forward to seeing you, hopefully, in another video. Right, got this far. Thanks for watching. Take care. All right, see you again.